My name is Ben Rifkin, and as many of you know, I'm Dean of Becton College of Arts and Sciences here at Fairleigh Dickinson University. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our event today, an event organized as part of our vibrant history of partnership with the United Nations. We can say that FDU's connection to the United Nations was born in 1945, when our president and founder, Peter Sammartino, whose portrait graces this very room in the back in the middle, um, uh, attended the signing of the UN Charter in San Francisco. Ever since the United Nations headquarters was established in New York City, Fairleigh Dickinson University students began to make regular visits there as part of our university's historic and ongoing commitment to uh, helping our students become dynamic global citizens. Since then, we have regularly invited ambassadors and other UN dignitaries to teach here at FDU. FDU has also given honorary degrees to 19 United Nations officials, including His Excellency Tripi Lee, the UN's first Secretary General, as well as the immediate past Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. We have ongoing relationships with numerous UN agencies, including the UN Office of Global Communication and the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Indeed, Fairleigh Dickinson University was the first university in the world to be granted special consultative status by the UN's Economic and Social Council. We are one of the most active institutions of higher education engaged in the work of the United Nations. One part of our commitment to providing students with an education that is personal, transformational, and students in the room, can you? Global. It's our tagline, personal global transformation. It's on, it's on the back of your chairs. Yeah. <laughs> in addition, we provide learning opportunities for UN diplomats and staff, more than 200 of whom have earned a master's degree from FDU in administrative science and diplomacy or global affairs. Fairleigh Dickinson's United Nations Pathways Program, run by the Office of International Education, offers video conferences, the Ambassador Forum, United Nations Headquarters tours and briefings, courses on the United Nations, internship and volunteer opportunities for students, membership in UN NGO committees for our faculty, partnerships with other UN accredited NGOs, participation in global conferences, and many, many more activities. Students attending today, please consider getting more involved. Today is one of our ambassador fora, and we are delighted and honored to host His Excellency Ambassador Fergal Mitten, the permanent representative of Ireland to the United Nations. He joined the mission last year, leading the team for the final months of Ireland's term on the Security Council. Prior to his UN appointment, Ambassador Mitten has held numerous appointments in Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs, specializing in relations with the United Kingdom, the Americas, and the European Union. He's also, he also served a term in the European Monitoring Mission in Sarajevo from 1996 to 1997. Today, Ambassador Mitten will engage in conversation with Dr. Jason Scorza, our Vice Provost for International Affairs, um, about Ireland, the United, Nations, uh, uh, the United Nations Security Council, given the role that the Security Council has played and continues to play in addressing global challenges of war and peace, pandemic, climate change, refugee crises, natural disasters, famine, and there's probably more. We, uh, we may run out of time, dear Rick, and if that's all right with you. Uh, you're going to do what you do. Okay. Um, so this is where I say the phrase you've been waiting for. Please extend a warm FDU welcome to His Excellency, Ambassador Fergal Mighty. Ambassador, welcome to Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, I will briefly explain the ground rules to, uh, to our audience. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, attended a UN Pathways Ambassadors Forum in the past, uh, the format is that of a conversation uh, between the ambassador and myself. Uh, we will have plenty of time for Q&A uh, from the audience, uh, but please note that we are also video recording the uh, program. Uh, so please silence your phones, um, and uh, if you do need to uh, move around the room, uh, please try to do so quietly. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I always want to ask the question, what possessed you? 
to speak here or, or to Well, <laughs> I mean, we made you an offer you couldn't yeah, refuse, yeah. Let's, let's be honest. No, why diplomacy? How did you come to be where you are today? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's just, well, firstly, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for the invitation. I'm really pleased that you're not lying in the park or at the beach. It's a beautiful day out there, so I appreciate you coming into a, a darkened room uh, to listen to me. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I, I think back, I, I was in college, I was in, you know, your shoes in the mid-1980s, 85 to 1990, I majored in history. And at that time, you, you look at the world at that time, the, the Soviet Union existed. In 1985, it looked impregnable. It looked as if it wouldn't be there forever. Likewise, the Iron Curtain across Europe, uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa looked as strong as ever. Uh, China was not an economic powerhouse, anything but Japan was the powerhouse. I remember being in Boston in 1987 for my J1 working visa summer, it's something a lot of Irish people do. And I remember people in a cafe worrying about Japan and Japan economically taking over and buying up all of the USA. And it seems there was no mention of China. Uh, Yugoslavia was still in existence. Uh, Afghanistan, the Soviets were in Afghanistan. So it was a very different world. And as my years in college developed and went on, um, from 85 to 89, followed the Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union collapsing, Yugoslavia collapsing, the move towards um, releasing Nelson Mandela. I remember that moment very, very vividly in South Africa, released from prison at the start of, of negotiations in South Africa. Uh, the Middle East, we had the Oslo Accords, uh, beginning, you know, early early 1990s, uh, President Bush played a very strong role there. It was a very interesting time to be interested in international affairs. The, the, the techno tectonic plates that were kind of almost sealed and hardwired after 1945 were moving and shifting, certainly in my continent, and obviously that had huge implications for the US and, and globally. And on my own island, um, uh, we were working we were seeing the very, very first signs of a peace process in relation to Northern Ireland and the conflict that had been ongoing there since 1968-69. So it was a real period of ferment and period of possibilities that actually diplomacy, international relations was a way of addressing these huge global challenges. So for me, that was, that was the inspiration. The, the reality was much more mundane. My mother, God rest her, saw this advertisement in a newspaper uh, advertising vacancies in our State Department, in, in our Foreign Ministry, and said, Fergal, you should apply for that. And, and being the good, dutiful son that I was, I did. And um, I was very inexperienced. Back in those days, there was no real experience or to, um, of internships, certainly not in Ireland. So uh, some people in the interview just took a punt on me, and uh, it's, been, it's been very interesting ever since. And I'm glad they did. Uh, but it wasn't, my CV wouldn't stand uh, uh, comparison with, with yours, even now as young students, and I have my colleague Alessandri who is working with us in the mission. Um, it's a much more competitive space, I have to say, for young people coming into the jobs market today in the international relations sphere. Uh, but I suppose that's the, that was a very long answer to a short question. Uh, but it was the period it was really, really interesting. And in fairness, you know, many of those issues you mentioned in the Soviet Union, Russia, you mentioned Afghanistan, you mentioned the Middle East peace process in Ireland. President Biden is in Ireland today, uh, marking 25 years of our peace agreement. Uh, so many, many of those issues are, are still live. We'll talk about the Security Council. Since last February, since the invasion of Ukraine by, by the Russian Federation, we're back into a Cold War scenario in terms of relations and the Security Council, in terms of engagement. So, you know, very often what goes around comes around and history does repeat itself, uh, and not always in a positive way. What, what, what I think we're all going to take away from that um, is, is that you blamed your mother. Um, but perhaps more germane, you know, the, the, the political context during the period that, that you've highlighted, um, you know, from the, the mid-1980s to the early 90s, um, certainly was one of dramatic change. Um, and it was a transitional period. Is it your sense that that transition has melded into uh, a new paradigm, or, or have we been in sort of endless transition? I think we've been in endless transition, really. I, I think there was some 
optimism uh, in 1990, 1991, 92 with the fall of communism that the, the liberal idea and ideology had, had won. Had, had, you know, and uh, I think there was books written about it. The end of history, you'll know all about that. Which, which seemed extraordinarily optimistic. Even then I thought that was pretty optimistic. Uh, and I think what we've seen is an outworking of the messiness of a multipolar world. Uh, there's a simplicity to two superpowers uh, you know, facing off against each other and learning the tools of diplomacy. I, mean, I, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the movie 13 Days about the Cuban Missile Crisis where Bobby Kennedy is talking to President Kennedy about how you, you send messages to your enemy to not, to not make mistakes, you know, to not overreach, to understand each other's point of view, how far we'll go, how far we won't go. And you know, from 45 right through the US, the US saw were developing those tools of communication to avoid a catastrophe. Uh, and it was simple, it was gridlocked, uh, it wasn't very satisfactory for the, for the people of, of the USSR, it certainly wasn't satisfactory for the people of Poland, etc., who were living behind the Iron Curtain, but there was a simplicity to it in terms of managing international relations. What we've seen then, you know, since then, has not been the victory of one concept, of one idea, the liberal, liberal democratic ideal. Um, We've seen a very, very messy, messy world order develop in, in you know, first we saw the, the dissolution of the USSR, the dissolution of, of Yugoslavia, the dissolution of Czechoslovakia, we saw a lot of that. Some of it was smooth, relatively peaceful, some was anything but, and I served in Bosnia in 1996-97, and I saw where it, it was not smooth. Uh, but we've seen, we've seen the rise of China, we've seen the, the increasingly muscular India asserting itself, uh, Africa wants to say, we've seen developments across Latin America and it's, it's, it's been hard to put a, a simple single framework on all of that. Um, I think we've certainly seen the defeat of, of communism as an economic concept, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was an abject failure, but we've seen various tensions around capitalist, unbridled capitalist, social democracy, the constraints on the state, um, these are all playing out. Uh, and we've seen, we've seen, you know, some of the great powers of the day, particularly Russia go through various iterations, China go through various iterations. I think we've seen in the US, in your own country, these challenges. Um, I was speaking to, to one of your colleagues earlier, you know, and we we're talking about that sense of America first. Why are we sending our young people to die in never ending wars abroad? And, you know, I, I, I've been in the graveyards of Normandy, I've been in, in Arlington, and you see young men from Ohio and Idaho and Missouri dying in foreign wars. I totally understand that concept, you know. Um, I suppose what we look for in, in Europe and what we look for in Ireland and what we look for in the UN is positive US political engagement. And that's really important. If, if America goes missing in a political way from the world, then we all have a problem. Uh, because, you know, for and I'm not saying America is, is, is perfect, I'm not saying America is, is, is heaven and earth, uh, but it's been an extraordinarily positive agent of international peace and security. We know that in Europe, very particularly, and uh, we know it in Ireland. We would not have had a peace process without the involvement of presidents from President Reagan on to President Clinton and onwards. It's been a really, really positive engagement, political and diplomatic engagement and economic engagement. Um, and I must say the, 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 the involvement, the leadership provided by the current US administration on Ukraine has been really, really, really important, really special, and, and indispensable. No other, no other country could do that. So if, if that's a, an appeal for engagement, it's, it is political engagement and diplomatic engagement. I think that's really, really important. But again, a very long answer to a short question. I, I forgot what the we question We live in was. a very, very messy world. The simplicity of, of 45 to 89 is completely gone. I doubt it's ever coming back. Um, and I, I think when we look at Russia today, we see the outworkings of 89, 1991. We see, in many ways, the, the old regime went away and collapsed, but the KGB didn't. Uh, and elements of, of the old regime didn't go away. And some of what we're seeing today is an outworking of the sense of loss of pride and loss of prestige uh, that flowed from that. Uh, and and it's, you know, it, it can go in many, many ways. We in, in Europe and we in the UN, we, we look at Russia, we also look at China. China is a very, very interesting example. I, I served in the UN back in the 90s for a short period. 
uh, China was not an assertive, active member of the of the UN. It, it protected its interests, as you'd expect, but it didn't really engage proactively other than protecting its interests. Now it's a very, very active, very effective player. It's sent very, very effective diplomats. It's you know working relationships across uh, 193 members. Uh, and it's investing and building economic relationships across Africa, across Asia. It has many deep relationships, economic relations with US companies and European countries. So unlike the Soviet Union in 45-89, which was a geopolitical challenger, it wasn't an economic challenger, uh, China is both uh, an economic partner, economic challenger, political uh, challenger. It, it's a very interesting and in some ways more difficult and complex relationship to manage for, for any US administration, for the European Union, for other partners. What I will say though, and what, what hasn't changed, is the, the countries and entities that believe in rules-based diplomatic relations, believes in the UN Charter, believes in peaceful dispute of, res of, of conflict, believes in a, in a, a rules-based trading order, we do have to work together the, in the European Union, Ireland, France, Germany, the UK has left the European Union, but it's an international partner, the US, Canada. We are the countries that believe in the democratic system. We are the countries that believe in the UN Charter and those values. We don't always get them right. We don't, we make mistakes. So, you know, again, I want to say that, but our leaderships in our countries have guided the world to a more peaceful place since 1945 and that partnership is desperately needed today and into the future. I want to, I want to pick out one thing that, that, that you, you said about the Cold War era diplomacy, uh, which is uh, about sending messages. Now, those messages, sometimes you, know, you sent a nice letter, Sometimes you picked up, you know, the, the special, you know, red phone in, in, in the Situation Room. But a lot of the messages were symbolic. There were things that the Soviet Union would do, you know, move in troops here or move in troops there, uh, that, that the U.S. would do. And even though the messaging wasn't using words, both sides were speaking the same symbolic language. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were signs of that unraveling, and the two sides not understanding the symbolism of, of what they were trying to, to signal to the other side. And that was extremely dangerous. It was the most dangerous moment in the whole war. I think today, and, and I'm, I'm very interested in, in your view of this, I think that diplomats today don't know that language of sending messages anymore and are very, very prone to misinterpret gestures by um, uh, uh, their counterparts. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, specifically of, of the Russia, Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think until 20 minutes after the invasion started, the U.S. State Department didn't think that they were going to do it or do it in that way. Maybe a five-mile incursion, declare victory, a sort of like they did in the Republic of Georgia, you know, a, a sending a signal. But there was no signal that the State Department seemed to pick up on. Have we lost that? language? Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I, I was in Ireland at that time. I wasn't here at the UN. And I'd have to say the, the US system was very clear in warning publicly uh, and revealing publicly its intel around US uh, Russian troop movement. So I, while it may have been interpreted as, as you know, a, a short incursion, I think the US was quite effective in, in, in explain to allies, something's happening here, something is afoot, don't think it isn't happening. So I wouldn't entirely, entirely agree. Now, the extent of it um, was certainly uh, 
Lithuanian diplomats, Ukrainian diplomats, Baltic diplomats were saying this is bigger than what what you're hoping for. There's always an optimism bias. You hope it'll be a, something less than it was. But I suppose, you know, I, I can't speak of the capacity of the, of, the, of the U.S. State Department. You know, it, you know, in that period, 45 to 89, it was a it was a deep specialization of criminology when people knew the languages, knew the knew the both the both the actual language, but also the diplomatic language and their expertise in reading what's happening in, in the Kremlin. You know, in a multipolar world, you imagine there's 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 China specialists, there's Afghan specialists, there's Middle East specialists. It's it's you know those it can be hard to keep track. Um, and certainly, I suppose since since 9/11, I imagine a lot of focus has been on the Middle East and what's happening in that part of the world for obvious reasons. Um, I think it's important to to understand and get back to that language of of diplomacy, but the language of messaging. And I, 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 if I would say, I think the U.S. administration has been good in sending messages to Russia, saying, "Okay, we are not going to put troops on the ground in Ukraine, but one foot of Russian military into NATO territory, and we're in trouble." And that's a very, very important message. And I think the message that has, it seems to have been received in the Kremlin, and that's very, very important. Likewise, sending a very, very clear message around: you use nuclear weapons. We're in a very different situation there. That's and and also in fairness, China has sent a similar message to the Kremlin. So that messaging is very very important, um, and also the message that you know the U.S., NATO, etc., will support Ukraine militarily as well as politically to free its territory, but not to invade. So again, you know, getting that nuance, that subtlety. It's not about regime change in Moscow. It's not about you know stepping into Russian territory, it's about reclaiming what has been taken by the Russian military yeah, and that's an important message. But it, it, it's, it's a, they're really important skills. I think as well, you know, what we really need are places like the UN where, where diplomats meet quietly. And again, I was speaking to colleagues earlier, we lost that during the Zoom era, the COVID era, you know, that, that quiet conversation that takes place in the corner, in the grey that keeps channels open, that feeds back to capitals in difficult moments. That's really important. Uh, I, I don't know who, who coined the phrase, but, but diplomacy is a contact sport. You have to be meeting people quietly. And sometimes that means people occasionally taking risks in our own peace process in Northern Ireland. That meant people taking risks both in the, in the groups that were combatants, uh, but also in, in political and military circles and in, in, in official circles to reach out to try to gauge the level of, of seriousness of intent on the part of the other party, whether these were serious or truths for peace, whether they weren't. Very difficult, very shadowy, with high risks there. In Northern Ireland, you get that wrong, people would have, would have, would have died. Uh, you know, careers ruined, governments embarrassed, all the rest of it. So these, these, that's just one example, that's just a small example of, of that. We would have seen it in the Oslo peace process in terms of, of bringing the PLO and the Israeli government into a peace process we've seen in South Africa. Those quiet conversations, as well as the public messaging, are really, really important. And they're really, it's, it's where the rubber hits the road. It can, be, it can be challenging, it can be dangerous, both physically and in terms of, of reputation, if it goes wrong. If it goes wrong, governments will deny it. That's the way it is. Uh, so the, these are tricky moments, uh, but they're important skills nonetheless. And I would say even more so than in the in the previous simpler uh, two superpower era. Well, let's let's turn to the institution of the United Nations yeah. and and specifically the the institution of the Security Council. Uh, I'd like to start out with a very general question um, before we get into your your personal and direct experience. Um, the general question is. Why would any country want to be elected to the Security Council knowing, A, how much work is required, how many resources need to be committed, and at the end of the day, any of the permanent five has the capability of vetoing anything that the non-permanent member uh, may want to put forward? Why? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, and it's a question we actually ask ourselves. Ireland is not a permanent member, obviously. We go for election about once every 20 years. Uh, our first stint was in, in 
was in in the early 60s uh, during the, the Bay of Pigs. Uh, 20 years later, uh, we had the Falklands War, which was difficult for our relations with, with the UK. Fast forward 20 years, and it was 9-11. Uh, uh, and fast forward 20 years, we thought it was the fall of Kabul and Afghanistan that would be the major issue of our period in the Security Council. It was actually, that was, that was only the starter and it was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So things happen. Why do we want to go? Because we believe in the UN. For Ireland, the, a, a world system based on order, based on values, based on rules is really, really important for us. We're a small little island, we've had a difficult history. Um, we know that in a world where might conquers right, then we are we are in trouble. Uh, so for us, from the very first moment of our independence 100 years ago, our leaders sought to join the, the League of Nations. Uh, we joined the European Union. We, we joined the UN in 1955. We believe in that in that global collective working together on the basis of rules and on the basis of, of shared shared values, it's really, really important for us. So in a sense, our security policy is based on, on effective multilateral institutions working well together. In that scenario, we believe we should put our shoulder to the wheel, that we should contribute to a better functioning UN, and that we should bring our values there as a member uh, on, a, on a reasonably regular basis. And for us, 20 years is about right. We also go for elections to the Human Rights Council. We believe that you know a UN that works well for all of us is in our interest as well as in our values. So that, that's that's actually a, a short answer, um, and we want to bring that perspective to bear. Uh, it's a lot of effort for us, a lot of resources. You go for election, you have to really really work hard to get it. We use Bono. Bono was our well, was our uh, he was in a band called U2 back yeah, in the day. I was, was going <laughs> to say that, okay. that some of the kids. <laughs> okay. He was, he was big back in the day, but um, no, we campaigned hard, and we campaigned hard on, on our values uh, and our experience as a country that, that suffered colonialism, that suffered imperialism, that suffered famine, that suffered conflict, and that has really tried to make the, the, the wor a world that is based on the peace and resolution of conflict a calling card. So that's what we work on, we work on, and we were elected, we, I think we just scraped through the exact number of votes. Uh, it's been a very busy two years. It, we need a lot more resources. You know, we don't just come and speak on one issue that's of interest to us. When you're on Security Council, you turn up, you have to speak and be knowledgeable and have views on every conflict. Um, I spoke about Afghanistan, I spoke about Ukraine, but 90% of our workload over the past two years was on conflict in Africa, uh, Myanmar, etc. So, and Colombia, where there's a successful peace process. So the agenda is heavy. For a small administration like Ireland, it's, it's, uh, it's hugely um, impactful, uh, but we feel it, it's of real value and it's really important. And it, likewise, you know, it's important that, that countries like Albania, Mozambique, Kenya have their say and bring their values to the Security Council. Yes, we can be vetoed uh, by the Parliament 5 at any given moment. Um, in fairness, China rarely uses veto, doesn't really like to. France and the UK have, have voluntarily not used their veto since 1989. Uh, the US doesn't like using the veto, will use it mainly in relation to Middle East, Palestine, Israeli issues. Uh, unfortunately, we have, a, uh, we have a permanent member that, that does use the veto, not just in relation to Ukraine. We, we tabled and led with Niger on the resolution highlighting and trying to combat the impact of climate change and security. And if you see, if you look at conflicts in Africa, in the Horn of Africa, Somalia, the Sahel, the impact of climate change on, on driving conflict is, is, is obvious. Uh, and when, when our colleagues from Niger and Kenya and Ghana spoke about that in a very impactful way, I mean, it was undeniable. And yet Russia vetoed that resolution and India voted against it. So, but we, feel, we, we still felt it was worth doing. We felt it raised awareness of this issue, it brought it to a, a higher threshold, and we hope that future Security Council formations will take it up again. So, so for us, we don't see it as a failure. Clearly, we were disappointed, but we felt it was worth doing. In other areas, we've achieved success. We, we, we worked with the US, with your ambassador, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, on securing uh, an exemption for humanitarian organizations to UN sanctions regimes. What does that mean? In many parts of the world, the UN Security Council has imposed sanctions, say, 
in relation to the Afghanistan, uh, the, the Taliban in Afghanistan, in relation to actors in Somalia and elsewhere who are driving conflict. Um, but that makes it very hard then for humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross to bring aid into Somalia because a lot of banks and major suppliers won't, once they hear there's a UN sanctions regime there, they will not engage with humanitarian organizations. It's a real chill factor. And so for us, and indeed for the US administration, that was, an, that was a very difficult and regrettable byproduct of an important sanctions regime. Therefore, we worked to secure agreement. We got 14 out of 15 uh, to agree a, a, a humanitarian carve-out for sanctions regimes. And we feel that actually uh, reinforces the strength of the UN sanctions regime, uh, but it allows humanitarian organizations to get you know, desperately needed aid to humanitarian to pop populations in desperate need. So again, that's just a small example of where we can work effectively to make a difference. Likewise, we worked with um, Norway to keep the the aid corridor open between Turkey and northeast Syria. Now, in that region, again, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but four million people in that part of the world needed that aid coming in, and that was the only aid corridor that that is open. Uh, this was before the, 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 the earthquake in that region, so it, even now, I mean, obviously it's in a worse, far worse situation. But we felt that was a lifeline. We had to work very, very hard to secure agreement. We worked with Syria off, you know, in, in the corridors. We worked with, with all member states on Security Council, including Russia, uh, to secure agreement. And you have to do that. If you're on the Security Council, that means working with all 15 members to get what you need to do. But we felt it was really important. Had that not succeeded, that corridor would have closed on the 1st of January of this year, and there would have been no aid corridor when the earthquake struck. So that just shows not only was the four million, many more millions an hour line on that corridor. So again, for us, it's not just about words on page or changing a word here or putting in a comma there. It's about making real impact on the ground, and that's what we try to really prioritize. Were, were you at the UN the previous time Ireland sat on the Security Council? Uh, no, I wasn't. You were not. No. But you were, if I may use the term, uh, parachuted in uh, midway through yeah. the, the term. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you? What, walking into that room yeah, I, I think for, at that time? For, uh, just to explain contact, we won an election to the Council in 2020. I then started our two-year membership 2021-2022. Uh, my previous, uh, my, my predecessor, Geraldine Bourne-Nason, was appointed to be our ambassador to Washington. And in our system, that's the, that's the biggie. It's a very big relationship. So she left in August. I took over and completed our term for five months. For me, it's, um, yeah, to be honest, it's the top table of diplomacy for an Irish diplomat. It happens once every 20 years. It's, 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 it's a generational thing. Uh, I, I compare it to a... Uh, to, uh, you're up there. It's it's like a it's like a Super Bowl final. It's like a, you know you are you are competing against the very best in your trade. You are dealing with the biggest issues of the day globally, and yeah, it's a step up. But I must say uh, we had a great team, uh, and they took me, they threw me into the Security Council. And they won, and they helped me to ensure we didn't drop the ball, we didn't make any mistakes, we didn't fumble in the last few months. And for us that was very important. We didn't want to start strongly and then just finish off and just you know, ride out the last four few months. We were given a two year mandate by the membership of the UN. We wanted to work on that. So in that resolution I spoke about the humanitarian exemptions. That was in our last few days of the council in December. We also secured a renewal of the peacekeeping mandate in Bosnia, which is very, very important for me personally and for our troops uh, who are serving in Bosnia, again, keeping the peace there. So for us, it was important we finished it strongly as we started uh, and, and you know, for me, you know, I come from a country that, that has that had to struggle hard for its independence uh, and for me to sit behind the, 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 the table and security councils behind the Ireland plate is a very, very important, both personally and professionally, but also for Ireland to be there, to, to be an independent country, a, trying to shape and make the world a better place is very, very important. It's very important for us politically, but also for our people. Thank you. Among the issues that the Security Council has, has grappled with 
um, uh, over the past year uh, is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What can you tell us about those conversations that the Security Council has, has had? Yeah, I can talk about conversations. I can't, talk, I can't really talk about the effect of unsuccessful action. Uh, I think for us in the room that day, we were there when the, the words of invasion came through, the UN Secretary General was in the room, all the numbers in the room, and even though it had been signaled in some sense that something was going to happen, you know, the scale and the extent of it and the fact that it did happen. And I think the fact that it was, that the invasion was, was undertaken by a permanent member of the Security Council was, I think, deeply shocking. My, our Kenyan colleague said, you know, multilateralism has died today. Um, and it really has challenged the UN, and has challenged multilateralism, has challenged the, the Security Council to be effective when you have a permanent member who is the aggressor. You know, uh, very, very simple, very black and white. You know, you, the Russians are the aggressor here, and yet they have a veto power and they hold some sway in the Security Council. During our term, from, from the 24th of February right through to the 31st of December, there were at least 50 meetings of the Security Council on Ukraine. Um, very often, tit for tat. Uh, uh, meetings that we called collectively to shine a light on what Russia was doing in terms of, of, of the war itself, in terms of, of uh, militarizing the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, in terms of, of taking children from their parents in Ukraine and, and stealing them and bringing them to Russia. Uh, all of those issues we brought to the table uh, for discussion. We, we tried to bring in uh, briefers from the UN, briefers from civil society in Ukraine, uh, uh, on the ground reporting straight in saying this is what's happening, don't let them tell you it's not true, this is what's happening. Uh, our own foreign minister flew to Bucha and saw the mass graves. He flew to Odessa to see the operation of the Black Sea Grain Initiative where the UN has brokered a deal whereby we can get grain out to the, the, the wider world. Um, and we, we tabled all those meetings, we brought that testimony back in. But very often in response Russia would then call a meeting and bring in briefers to, to talk about the, the, you know, the Nazi regime in Kyiv, or to talk about what you know, Kyiv is, is, is taking Russian children, kind of tit for tat. Um, last week we had the abomination, and I really use that word strongly, um, where the Russian presidency of the Security Council this month had a meeting on, on the issue of the, the protection of children in armed conflict. And actually one of the briefers was a person who is actively involved in Russia in organizing the, po the, the, the programs to take Ukrainian children from their parents and bring them to Russia and place them with, with Russian families. Just disgusting, to be honest. And that's, that's been a real, real challenge to the, to the credibility and the integrity of the UN and the UN system. Um, do we give up on it? No. Um, we, we, it's really important we keep on using the Security Council and using the UN to shine a light on what's happening, to bring in briefers, to, to say, to deny and to rebuff what was said after 1945 when, when many Germans said that never happened, the Holocaust didn't happen, that, that wasn't true. Uh, and it actually we needed the Nuremberg trials, we needed photograph evidence to say it did happen, it was true. What we're trying to do in the Security Council, we're trying to do in the UN is saying, no, this is happening in real time, this is fact, this, is, this isn't some um, fabrication. And to hold Russia to account day in day out. And I think it's having an effect. We have a mechanism now, a mechanism whereby if, if a permanent five member it uses veto in the Security Council, it goes automatically to a vote in the General Assembly of 193 members. And we've done that on a number of occasions where we've had votes in the General Assembly uh, condemning Russia's actions. And in those votes, four or five have voted with Russia. You can probably name them. Uh, but 141, 142, 143 members of the, of the UN have condemned Russia in explicit terms. That's really, really important. The rest were, were, were abstention for various reasons. But it's a hard, hard core. A huge majority of UN member states have called out Russia for its actions and continue to do so. And even in various elections to UN bodies, uh, including in ECOSOC, you mentioned candidates are standing, member states are standing 
specifically to block Russian membership of UN bodies, and that's succeeding too. So I think it's working, but for now, and until there's wholesale reform of the Security Council, Russia can block action in relation to its actions in Ukraine, but it's important to stand in Ukraine. It's really, really important. And, and I, commend, I commend the US, I commend the UK, I commend the European Union and Canada, and other countries like Albania who have stood unequivocally behind the people of Ukraine in this, in this conflict. Thank you. Uh, can we turn uh, perhaps to, to other foreign affairs priorities of, of Ireland? Uh, Ireland, uh, of course, is a member of the European Union, and the European Union is trying in its way to counterbalance Russia. What have they done? What, what can they do? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. The European Union is a complex organization. I don't know if any of you study it in your, in your, in your studies. I often went with our minister and, and, and prime minister to, to Washington, and even talking to congressional figures, senators, you know, it was, it's hard to explain the European Union. Um, what is it? It's not it's, the UN. It's not a military alliance. It's not, mil it's not a military alliance. It's an economic and political alliance. Uh, member states pool sovereignty in certain areas, so it's certainly more robust in many areas than the UN would be, or the OSCE, or the, the Organization of American States. It's, it's very, very different, but it's complex too. Um, What's been happening, I think, particularly since 1990, I mean, it's, it certainly started off as an economic free trade area. That's what we joined in 1973. It was, it was a peace process, yes, but in a sense, it was aiming to bring peace to the continent after two devastating conflicts, but to do so through economics, trade, to bring down barriers, to bring down borders, to ensure that we were so interconnected economically uh, and through people-to-people -people contact that war would be unthinkable. I think it's been an extraordinarily successful peace process. It's been an extraordinarily successful economic um, success. But politically, and certainly in defence terms, it's been more challenging. We're a neutral country. No, we're not a neutral country. We're a neutral in terms of non-military align, but we're clearly not neutral when it comes to Ukraine. We weren't particularly neutral in, in the Cold War. Uh, we even during the, the Second World War, we were we were very much neutral, but yet behind the scenes there was huge cooperation with the US and UK um, uh, military and political operations, and, and a lot of that has now come, been revealed in the archives that was revealed at the time. So we're not politically neutral, uh, and we're not neutral when it comes to conflict and to right and wrong and human rights, but we're not a member of a military organization, we're not a member of NATO, there's a whole lot of historical reasons for that. Um, well, and, and the European Union, you know, is not a military organization. Men, most of its members are members of NATO, and we've seen Finland have now joined, and Sweden is applying to join. Which, which is precisely the opposite of, of what Russia was trying to achieve. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I suppose for, for, for the European Union, for European countries, the relation with Russia has been difficult because there is strong economic links and a strong energy links. And for many, you know, for Germany, for many of the, the, the countries in Eastern Europe, there's a strong, or has been a strong energy reliance. Um, and, you know, it's a reality on our borders. It's a reality for Lithuania, uh, you know, part of Lithuania borders, borders Russia, um, the other Baltic border, Belarus. So it's a geopolitical reality that we have to deal with. So just, just, just trying to freeze out Russia has not been a policy, and I'm not sure it's been a, it's, it's been a, a reliable policy, um, or, or, you know, it's not been, it certainly hasn't been where many member states of the European Union have wanted to go, but the invasion has really changed perspectives. Uh, it's really sharpened how we view collectively our, our security. Um, you know, for Ireland, you know, we've had cyber attacks on our health service, we know where they came from. We've had Russian military jets in our airspace. We've had Russian uh, military vessels in our sea. This is something we're not used to. We, we, we've lived in a very, very peaceful part of the world for, for many, many years, um, not standing the northern no, conflict. No. But in terms of geopolitical stability, you know, when you're between you know, the, the, the US, Canada, UK, Norway, Netherlands, France. I, I've had my eye on the Norwegians for quite some time. <laughs> okay. let's, let's but, but, but what's happened is really shifted and changed the dial here. 
the, the European Union for the first time has agreed arms exports, uh, and quite massively so to, to Ukraine. Uh, we've accelerated the, the UN membership application of Ukraine. Uh, we've taken a huge number of refugees. Ireland alone has taken in 75,000, which is a large number in a very short space of time for a small country. Poland has taken in a million. So the European Union has moved with a speed I've never seen before. When you're trying to get agreement between 27 member states, that takes time. We've moved swiftly, and, and also there's been a huge emphasis put on energy diversification, on trade diversification, to not be reliant on, on Russia. Uh, and you know that, that's the reality we've all woken up to, and it's not going to change. I don't know when the war will end, I don't know how it will cease, but, but the reality of an aggressive Russia on our doorsteps in Europe is very, very real. And for us, you know, in Ireland, one of the real mantras of the European Union is solidarity among member states. You stand with each other. So many member states stood with us, all member states in the European Union stood with us in our issues with the UK around Brexit, Northern Ireland. Likewise, we stand with the Baltics, and we stand with Poland, Slovakia, and, and we stand with our partnership in Ukraine. So solidarity is very, very important. There's an evolving debate in Europe around security and defence. Um, we, we started in Ireland, we started a, a, a national conversation. We like conversations in Ireland. Uh, we, we tend to, if we have difficult issues, difficult issues in terms of public policy, uh, and we had them in relation to, say, abortion issue, abortion rights, abortion issue, reproductive rights for many years. We developed a system of citizens' assemblies and kind of nationwide town halls just to build build an understanding. So, in a sense, before you make any major policy decision in an area that's controversial, you have these kind of national dialogues, national conversations. We started one of them now just recently on security and defence. What does that mean in the 21st century in a world where we're in a continent that is facing threats that we haven't seen in many, in many decades? I don't know where the conversation will go, but it's certainly impacting in Ireland. I understand from our colleagues in, in Austria they are having similar conversations and clearly it's fast-tracked what was unthinkable in Finland five, ten years ago. Yeah. And the speed of change there has been extraordinary, Sweden likewise. And I suppose the world looks very different if you're living in Finland. Um, and a realisation that actually the, the years 1990 to you know, 2015, 2020, well maybe they weren't the norm, maybe they were the operation when it comes to, to Russian aggression, and that's a very disparity notion, but it's, it, if it is the reality, it's something you have to deal with and face up to in a very, in a very real way. You, you, thank you. Uh, you mentioned in passing uh, reliance of some European countries on uh, Russian energy exports, uh, principally natural gas, uh, I think. Uh, energy independence isn't going to happen overnight, and as long as you know, those, those pipelines are, are pumping. Um, where is the impetus going to come from? Yeah, I, I think, uh, as an opening, we see linkages with other issues. And, and, you know, to be honest, we all need, well, certainly in Europe, we feel we need to be collectively moving away from reliance on, 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 on fossil fuels. Uh, and we need to be developing, you know, um, uh, solar energy, wind energy, you know, renewable sources of energy. So I, I think what's happened, uh, you know, it, did have, it has spurred the European Union and it has spurred, spurred France, Germany, Ireland, and other countries to actually really invest in and really drive forward um, and science the hell out of, of getting, you know, mm. uh, renewable and alternative sources. That's not immediate, it's not overnight, and obviously, you know, many countries in Europe are looking at alternative sources of, of, of fossil fuels. Um, but I, I think it certainly is one of those those consequences, unintended consequences, is driving investment in in other sources of energy, and I think that's very, very important. And I think that's important for all of us not to be reliant on any one country, any one market, any one fuel. Uh, diversification is really important, and, and that's I think it's important whether we're we're in this extreme burning platform scenario with, with Russia, but it's important in, in other parts of the world. And you look at reliance on fuels from an unstable part of other, other unstable parts of the world as well. And I think we see the need that uh, there, there's wisdom in 
and hedging your bets across the board. You weren't re referring obliquely to Texas in any way? No. Good. I'm not a fellow. Um, <laughs> may, may we briefly talk about the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union, uh, referred to, of course, as Brexit? Um, are there still issues to be resolved as a consequence um, of Brexit? And, and could you outline for us what those issues are? Yes, well, firstly, Brexit was a sovereign decision of the UK, and we, we fully respect that. Um, we, can, we can regret it. I think the European Union is the lesser without the United Kingdom, without its economic uh, philosophy. Free trade is something we, we share very much, obviously, without its, its, its political, economic, um, and strategic contribution. So we, we feel the loss, uh, and it's not something that we, we welcome in any way. But we respect a sovereign vote of a sovereign country. I think that's really, really important to say. Why did we in Ireland uh, start getting worried? And I suppose it was because of the peace agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, which we worked hand in hand with the British government on and the US government. I mentioned President Clinton, Tony Blair. We worked to bring the parties together. We worked to find a way through a binary sovereign dilemma, which is, you know, um, back in 1921 when we got our independence, a, a clear majority in, in the northeast corner of Ireland wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom. Uh, about one third, maybe 40% wanted to be part of an independent sovereign Ireland. Um, the British government used a tool that was, that was common in the day of partition. Uh, it was used in India, it was used elsewhere. We didn't like it, it was an imposition. It was a power power play that we've, we've always regretted. Uh, and it left a very unhappy minority locked into Northern Ireland. I'm not gonna go into the, the, the long details, 60, 70 years, but it basically it, it erupted in conflict in 1969, 1970, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but the agreement that we crafted with the British government and with the support of, of, of the US and the support of the, 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 the European Union was to get away from that binary sovereignty and say people in Northern Ireland can be British or Irish or both. Uh, it would remain part of the United Kingdom as long as a majority in Northern Ireland wanted. So it, it wouldn't be a decision of Westminster. Uh, it wouldn't be a decision of all of the UK. It would be a decision for the people of Northern Ireland themselves. And also um, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic would be erased. So people living in, in parts of Northern Ireland felt Irish could move freely, travel freely, work freely, open businesses freely, uh, as if there was no border there. So in a sense, you know, it kind of, it, it was a very 21st century view of sovereignty, blended, shared, you know, like, 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 you know, undefined, and that kept everybody happy, and all in the context of the European, of a, sh of a joint, Euro a shared European Union, UK, Ireland, part of the European Union. Why did that matter for borders? because so much of the reasons why we could raise the border on the island of Ireland were, was based on a common European Union rule book around trade, customs, etc. So there was no need for customs posts. So through the peace process and through the European Union, we saw the eradication of military posts on the, on the island of Ireland and we saw the, uh, the dismantling of customs posts and people could travel freely and people could think, well, we're on one island. Uh, and, and seek employment. Seek well. employment, education, work, healthcare, access, all of those things. So it really meant a seamless island, island of Ireland, even though one part was part of the United Kingdom and one part was part of, of the, the, the Republic. Brexit really challenged that, because Brexit is, is based, particularly a hard Brexit, is based on a very 20th or even 19th century concept of sovereignty, which is hard borders, take back control, close borders, uh, and for us, we were really fearful of the, the reimposition of customs posts and a hard border on the Isle of Ireland, which we felt really undermined the, the vision and the promise of the Good Friday Agreement, of the Peace Agreement. And we, f we were fearful that it would, it would lead to political collapse of the agreement uh, and perhaps worse. So, and also, we felt it was a very, it was a, it was a getting away from the the promise of the Good Friday Agreement, which was that the future of Northern Ireland would be decided by the people of Northern Ireland, 
in the UK referendum on Brexit, a majority in Northern Ireland voted to stay within the European Union, 56 against 40, yeah, 56, 44, I think, was the figure. So again, we felt this was, here was, was the future of Northern Ireland being decided by a majority in the UK as opposed to within Northern Ireland. And I, I, I would interject a uh, majority of Scots yes. and a majority of um, uh, uh, Welsh. No, a majority, it was a majority in Northern Ireland, a majority in Scotland voted to stay in the European Union, a majority in England and Wales voted to leave the European Union. And given the, the, the population size in England in particular, that was decisive. So for, for those reasons, we really worked hard. We tried to sensitise the UK government, and we certainly sensitised the European Union about the implications of Brexit for Ireland. And we succeeded in securing that one of the four negotiating objectives of the, of the European Union in the post-Brexit negotiations would be ensuring no, no border in the United of Ireland. Uh, I think many in the UK, many political figures, weren't really aware of the issues. You know, certainly the, the era, the generation of Tony Blair and those who worked so hard on the peace process were fully aware of the implications and, and they spoke, Tony Blair spoke, warned the implications. John Major, former British Prime Minister, spoke. Uh, certainly, Irish American friends in Congress and the Senate were fully aware of the Richie Neal, Nancy Pelosi. But that that awareness was lacking in Westminster and it's taken a lot of effort. Uh, it's taken five, six difficult years of negotiation between the UK and, and the European Union. We hope there's a, you know, a recent tweaking which we hope can which was agreed between the, the, the UK, the new Prime Minister Richie Sunak and the European Union, which we hope will resolve the issues will allow, will ensure no hard border in the island of Ireland, will address some concerns that in some way Northern Ireland has been taken out of the UK in terms of trade and economic issues. So we hope that the, the circle has been squared. It's been done through diplomacy, negotiation, engagement, all those, all those tools that are really, really important. And it was, that deal was voted through Westminster by 489 to 14, so strongly supporting Westminster, strongly supporting the European Union. It is a strong backing of Washington, both the White House and in Congress. Um, some party, one party in particular in Northern Ireland is still considering and seeking clarification. What we hope we have through diplomacy and engagement and negotiation landed in a, in a situation whereby we can, we can put those issues to rest. And that's really important. It's, it's not just important for, the, for, for Ireland, but it's really important that the UK and the EU and the US have a really strong relationship on economic and trading issues, but also on political issues. And, and this was, this was an, an irritation. This was a piece of grit in that relationship with London, Brussels, Dublin, Washington. And we hope it, we found a resolution, because uh, that's important, not just for ourselves, but it's important geopolitically. And, you know, we, f we fear that regimes like Moscow feed on weakness, or perceived weakness, or perceived and division, division and division. So it's important that they see, you know, unity of purpose. Not always agreement, you know, Washington's not always going to agree with Brussels, you know, trade issues, economic issues, likewise with London, but that we see a unity of purpose against, against aggression, uh, and they don't see division, and that's important too. Thank you. Uh, I think this might be uh, an opportune time to see if any of our audience members uh, have questions for you. Yeah. Uh, and, and you should be forewarned that there, there is a day um, uh, once a year in the U.S. Uh, when all of us are Irish. Okay. Uh, this is not that day. Uh, so that's <laughs> okay. Before, uh, before we go to questions, can we just have a round of applause? Do we have a microphone for audience members? The, the handsome young fellow in the aisle. No, I'm talking about you. <laughs> and if you would please uh, uh, introduce yourself and, and then ask your question. Hi, my name is Austin Smith. Um, my question is, do you ever foresee the uh, Britain ever rejoin the European Union? Or there's any path for them to do so? That's a really interesting question. Um, I am reluctant to talk about other people's sovereign choices. Um, I would say there is always a path open, um, but it's hard to see the political reality 
in the UK at the moment. Um, certainly the Conservative Party in power at the moment wouldn't countenance that. And even the, the main opposition party, Labour, are not campaigning on, on that. They're campaigning to ensure that the, you know, that the relationship is, is better between Brussels and, and London uh, and to smooth out the trading difficulties. But there's no major political body in England or Wales that are campaigning for the UK to join the European mm -hmm. Union. And I, I, just looking on as an observer, I think the debate has been so difficult and divisive in the UK, I, I, I couldn't see it happening. Where are there two exceptions? The exceptions are Scotland uh, and the current government in Scotland, the, the, the Scottish National Party, uh, campaign for independence within the European Union. And again, I very agree that Scotland, that the choice of Scotland was overruled and that they didn't have self-determination when it came to staying on as a member of the European Union. But where the, the Scottish independent debate goes, I've no idea. But certainly the, the, the pro-EU feeling is much stronger in Scotland than it would be in, in England. And then in Northern Ireland, when we, um, when Brexit happened, our Prime Minister went to the European Council and secured agreement that if, if Northern Ireland was ever to vote to be, become part of a united independent Ireland, uh, as it's entitled to do in the Good Friday Agreement, then it would automatically become a member of the European Union. A bit like East Germany joining West Germany. So there'd be no debate. Once that vote happens, they would be part of the European Union. So there's two elements, Scotland, Northern Ireland, you know, but in terms of UK politics as a whole, I, 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 I can't see I can't see it at the moment. It's just it's just it's, it still is so divisive. And the ramifications of of moving away from 40 years of membership of a economic and political bloc are huge. And we can see that in, in current trading issues, uh, political issues, it, it, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, so I, I would say certainly the politics, politics don't point that direction anytime soon. But ultimately it's, it's a sovereign matter for, for, for the United Kingdom. And, and for 20 odd other members of the European Union who would need to vote to readmit. Yes, yes. I think, I vote, where's the question? The, the UK had a very, very, um, had a, almost a tailor-made relation uh, membership of the European Union. It had opt-outs in relation to the euro currency, it had opt-outs in relation to justice and home affairs issues. Uh, it had a number of opt-outs uh, being a founding member. Um, were it to reapply, I imagine there would be some discussion with, with the, the current 27 around those, those, those exemptions, but it's not for me to comment on that. But yeah, it, it would, obviously it would not be just a, a simple case of the UK saying, we want to rejoin, coming back to where we were in, in 2015, it would be also a matter for all the other member states, the current member states of the European Union to decide as well. So there would be negotiation. As is that, I mean, Ukraine is in the same position, you know, there's full support, but there's negotiations. There were those that predicted in a post-Brexit um, uh, financial world that some of the larger European banks would re-headquarter themselves in Dublin. Ha has that actually happened, or have there been signs of uh, economic opportunities for Ireland that perhaps weren't there prior to Brexit? I'm not going to comment specifically on individual banks. I don't think there's been a major drainage of banks from headquarters from London to, to that's where in the European Union, I'm not, an, I'm not a banking expert, so, but I, I don't think so. I suppose, where did we see opportunity? Well, first of all, we, we deeply regretted Brexit, didn't want it to happen, respect that it happened, but our aim effort has been to try and mitigate the impacts of Northern Ireland in the peace process. I suppose, where do we see advantage? We see it as we've always seen it, um, and our, our pitch to, to many, many companies, particularly US companies and elsewhere, in terms of foreign direct investment, is a very well-educated uh, workforce, a young workforce, a very stable economic business environment, uh, very stable corporate tax rates, uh, and being part of the European Union, and now being, I think, the only English-speaking member of the European Union, with all that means for doing business. Uh, so I suppose our, our calling card hasn't changed, except that now we are, you know, the sole English-speaking member of the European Union, and that, that, that may be another advantage there. But as, as anybody knows, and I know some of you will be doing business and are doing international finance, etc. Um, 
you know, the reasons why a company would locate or invest in, in an economy and society are very, and it's never just one issue, it's never just one, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a range of factors and we've always tried to ensure that we can, we can that our offering is more than just one and it covers a range. Thank you, excellent question. Uh, the young fellow in the, oh, no, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to rip the microphone from your hand. <laughs> <Be quick. laughs> I'm curious about your uh, thoughts. Introduce yourself. First, please. Please. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts about France. They've taken an increasingly muscular diplomatic approach, uh, especially in recent months, um, visiting Russia, visiting China. How much of that is uh, Mr. Macron playing a, a role, right, a diplomatic role, of character, so to speak, versus a genuine expression of dissatisfaction with Brussels, London, Washington? Uh, just kind of this, this, this is where we usually ask the person who asks the question what they think, <laughs> in, in, in order to play for time. Um, but but obviously you you know better than me. No, look, look uh, when you see France, France is is a permanent member of the Security Council, very effective player in international affairs, very effective player at the UN. We see that day in day out, uh, and I think any. French president would want to play a role globally. So I, I don't think we should be surprised that, that President Macron would, would want to do that. In the European Union sense, there's a very strong fulcrum of, of the Franco-German relationship. It's simplistically put that, that Germany provides the, the economic muscle in France, the political muscle. I think that's, that's shifted over. I think that's a bit simplistic now. Uh, but it's very, very important, uh, that relationship. And I, I, I you know, the idea that Macron is any different to any of his predecessors in terms of, of wanting to play a positive political, geopolitical role, I don't think we should be surprised by that. But I'd like to hear your answer. You, you, you probably don't have to be as diplomatic as I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm cynical. Yeah. Do, do you think he's planning for domestic points? Well, I think I'm certainly right. There's a lot of domestic unrest right now in France, and I think part, a lot of it is an effort to draw attention to that it's the moment to shine, or so he goes. Uh, so I see a whole bunch of hands. We'll take the gentleman in the front, and then the gentleman will far, 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 far back. Good afternoon. My name is Godwin T. Anadolian. I am happy to know that you mentioned Ireland and how it has been an active member of the United Nations. I do have just two short questions regarding Ireland. What would it take for Ireland to be united as a country, since we all know that there is Ireland as a country by itself and Northern Ireland. Also, what caused that division to begin with? And I wonder why many Irish people had a history of animosity towards Great Britain. Well, you, I mean, you asked a, a very important and interesting historic question, uh, and we could go back hundreds of years to talk about, um, uh, about English invasions of Ireland, if you want to. I, I, I you, you, you were the history major, not me. Thank you very much. Two very good questions. I'll, the, the, I'll start by referring back to the first uh, anglo irish Treaty negotiations in 1921, when uh, our revolutionary leader, Engel de Valera, met Lloyd George. And afterwards, Lloyd George is said to have he, he was asked, how, how did the conversation go? And he said, well, we started with 1169 and moved slowly from 1169 AD onwards. So that, that was the year that the, the first uh, Anglo-Norman English troops came to Ireland. Look, it, it's a long history of, of colonization. It's a long history uh, of, of, it's a very sorry history of pain, famine, hurt, political uh, denial. Um, and we, you know, at very, very various times, we have sought to be an independent country. Um, in 1801, there was a revolution, and uh, it was failed, like, like, like most. Uh, and the leader was executed. But in his speech from the dock, he said he looked forward to the day when Ireland would take its place among the nations of the earth. And uh, that's been something Irish people have wanted for for for, for centuries. And and many many Irish people who came here in the 1800s were fleeing famine, persecution, and they held that close in their hearts. And, and you know, the, the support we received from Irish America and America for our, our struggle for independence was huge. Um, and it would not have been achieved 
Why was it achieved? It was achieved post World War um, because we took our president at his word, uh, Woodrow Wilson, when he spoke about self determination and the rights of small nations. We took him at his word. Um, we we're a little bit disappointed with his response in Versailles, uh, but you know, so many nations, so many peoples won their independence in that period in Europe, uh, and we did too. But like, like many other parts of Europe, there were uh, elements left over, and I spoke about you know a, a, a large majority in parts of Northeast Ireland who wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom who had a very strong affinity. Uh, many of their ancestors would have come to Ireland in the 1700s. Uh, many of them came post-Reformation, so politics and religion and ethnicity got enrolled in one. But uh, the dissolution that the British government imposed in Ireland at the time was partition, uh, and that had a very difficult history. Uh, many people in the, in the community that we saw themselves as Irish uh, were discriminated against uh, and interrupted in conflict in 68, 69. Uh, so it, it's a long, long record of, of difficulty. But one of the great successes of the Irish peace process was, and also of the European Union, and our membership of the European Union together with the United Kingdom, was that we get to know each other a lot better. We got to know each other politically. We got to know each other politically, we got to know each other on an official level. Uh, my career, I joined in 1990, I was working with, with British officials for the first time, and they were working with Irish officials for the first time, and we got to realise in the European Union we shared many interests beyond trade, uh, we shared, we had differences of opinion, we had agriculture, but we weren't always talking about the ancient quarrel, we were talking about areas of shared endeavour, and it was through those relationships that we started to see the first efforts at developing a peace process that I mentioned. Uh, former UK Prime Minister John Major. He got to know our, our Prime Minister Albert Reynolds through European Union meetings and then they started to talk about Northern Ireland and say, can we do something here? So actually, you know, the friendship really developed as a byproduct of the peace process and as a byproduct of the European Union and we've worked so well together uh, and we had a really healing moment. There are some healing moments and this goes back to symbolism in international relations and you know in, in the early 1970s the German Chancellor went to Warsaw and bowed his head and kneeled at the at the uh, at a memorial for the victims of, of the of, of Germany and the Nazi invasion of Jewish and, and Polish um, and it was hugely healing. Uh, in Ireland we had a moment where uh, the Queen of England came to Ireland in 2011, first time uh, serving uh, British monarch had visited independent Ireland, uh, so it was 90 years. And she went to our, we have a memorial garden for those who fought and died for Irish independence. And she went to that and she bowed her head and she laid her wreath. And she showed respect to both that tradition in Ireland. It was hugely impactful. It was the first thing she did. And then the second day she went to a war memorial for all those in, in Ireland who had died in the first and second world, in the first world war in particular wearing British uniform. Many had, had fought for, for, for Britain, were still part of the United Kingdom at the time. Hugely symbolic moments. And now at a dinner that night she spoke about how we all have to, we have to bow to the past, but not be bound by it. So we, we acknowledge the hurt, the pain, the history, the difficulty. We don't try and sugarcoat that. But we don't allow that to hold us back in building friendships between two countries that are side by side and should be friends. So in a sense, you know, that's, that's, that was a real high point and symbolism played a really important part in that. Brexit has caused a bit of difficulty there, uh, but I think we've again we found a way through using the tools we learned uh, to find a way through. Uh, and again, we saw the importance of international support. And in, in any peace process you see that works and works well. And there aren't that many, but you see international support. And for Ireland, it was the US and also the European Union. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've been involved in various peace negotiations, uh, and I've been involved in, in Northern Ireland negotiations where we tried to deal with issues that caused the political instability. And when we work well with the British government, that's when the magic happens. And I saw it happen in 2020. Our two ministers, our prime ministers, officials like myself, worked so well together, we, 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 we unlocked the difficulty. And I hope we've been able to do so again. So, yes, there was a long-term, a very difficult history. We're not alone in that. Many, many 
people have that very difficult history so more so you know it's it's but we've really tried to to mend history and to to bow to it but not be bound by it and, and I'm, I'm a Republican in the Irish sense of the word I believe in the independence of Ireland I believe in I don't believe in monarchy I don't believe in aristocracy um, uh, but there was real symbolism in the British monarch in the, in the British Queen coming and doing those symbolic gestures uh, and our president has gone to has gone on a state visit to the UK and, and, and had similar moments of symbolism which have been very healing and, and that's really important Thank you for your question and, and for your answer. Um, so, I mean, it seems to me that Ireland. Uh, yeah, I think that's the, I think that's what the United States Ireland, and, and I, I, I do want to come to that. Just very, very. We haven't got all The United. Uh, one of the prom, one of the core elements of the Good Friday Agreement was the principle of consent. Uh, and what that there was two elements there. One was self determination that the, the future of the island of Ireland would be decided by the people of the island of Ireland alone. Because for history, the Irish people were denied self-determination. Even the treaty in 1991 was imposed, you know, militarily, uh, at the threat of war and partition. So for, for part of the healing and part of the agreement was that the future of Ireland would be decided by the people of Ireland alone. Uh, really, really important. It wouldn't be imposed by Westminster. It wouldn't be imposed by anybody else. The second part of that was, and within that, um, the future of Northern Ireland would be decided by the people of Northern Ireland. Um, and in the agreement, it explicitly states, if the people of Northern Ireland and the people of the Republic of the, the, the South agree to unify, then that, that, those wishes will be acceded to by, by Westminster. So it's, it's a promise in the heart of the Good Friday Agreement that if that's what the people of Ireland want, and if that's what the people of Northern Ireland want, in a democratic way, that's completely legitimate and that's a pathway. Um, as long as it's done by exclusively peaceful democratic means. At the moment, polling is very clear that there is not a majority in Northern Ireland for, for even United Ireland. Um, what there is a strong support for is making the agreement work, making the institutions of the agreement work. What does that mean? It means a devolved parliament in Belfast for Northern Ireland. It means north south institutional bodies, which brings Northern Ireland ministers, Irish ministers together, working on, on, on issues of concern for the entire island. There are two major elements. So, what people want in Northern Ireland at the moment is those institutions to work. They absolutely want peace, absolutely want political stability, absolutely want economic development and prosperity. Um, but, but within the Good Friday Agreement is, is an assertion that the desire to have United Ireland is legitimate, is valid, and it's, it's, it's absolutely legitimate to work for that in a peaceful democratic way, just as it's equally legitimate to work to maintain Northern Ireland's part of the United Kingdom. So it, it's again getting away from that hard edge 19th century sovereignty to that you know, fluid 21st century non-binary. I think that's really important to help us un to unlock that what happens in the future? I don't know. A former Prime Minister of Ireland said in 1998 when we signed the peace agreement, all the people on the island of Ireland, north and south, decided to step on a train and start out on a journey and we don't know the destination. But what we want to do is work for economic and political prosperity on both parts of the island and where the journey takes us, the journey will take us. Thank you for your time. We'll come to you next and the fellow behind you, but first in the way back. Thank you for your time, Ambassador. My name is Eric Bialet. And I want to ask you, what do you think about the rising of BRICS, a powerful force that we haven't seen, that, that we've seen growing outside of Europe? There's the right concerns in the European Union as we see the rising of colonial, ex-colonial nations. And does it have, do you think it will have a negative impact in the current United Nations as we know it? Um, I think was it BRICS? He says that that kind of Brazil, Russia, India, China. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's very important that we see countries around the world develop and rise economically. Uh, we're currently involved in in the UN, and I'm personally involved in an effort to revitalise the sustainable development goals. What are they about? They're about leaving no one behind, bringing everyone out of extreme poverty, ensuring access to health, clean water, education, healthcare and economic opportunity, good jobs. So I think it's really positive uh, that we see economic development on a global basis. 
And it's, it's in our interest, it's in the US interest, it's in the European interest. Why do I say that? Because in 1945 and 1946, the US really did something extraordinary. Instead of punishing Germany, instead of punishing Japan, it invested the Marshall Fund, etc. So it learned all the lessons from, from, from the end of the First World War, which were the lessons of Versailles, the lessons of, 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 of um, revenge, and did the exact opposite. And it was brilliant. And it did so, and it, it revitalized, the US single-handedly revitalized Europe in an extraordinary act of generosity, but also a self-interest, because here now was an economy growing in Europe, growing in Japan, in which US companies could invest and, and engage with and build. So it's that sense of rising boats lift us all. It's not, it's not either or, it's not I'll do better against him or her, we'll all rise together. And that's something that's very, very core for us in Ireland. And, and the European Union has been about that. Our economy has blossomed since what, what it was in 1973. Um, but that's been an interest of the entire European Union, both economically stable, politically stable, the European Union is doing likewise now in the newer member states that joined, you know, in Eastern Europe, etc. So, you know, that's so to see economies rise around the world is not necessarily a threat. It can be a threat if that economic muscle is used to to beggar other countries or to try and compete in a very aggressive way, or to use that economic muscle in a geopolitical, aggressive, military way. Um, where are we seeing? I mean, I, I think I think the BRICS. You know, it was a phrase that was used. I'm not sure it holds up much water now. Clearly, India, China are, are roaring ahead. Not sure about Russia, to be honest, other than in terms of, of energy supply. But economically, I'm not sure. Uh, and I think Brazil has had its own challenges, etc. But certainly, you are seeing um, the you know economic power is China, but also India. And we've seen a very assertive India in the Security Council, a very assertive India in the in the in the UN and regionally, and it makes no bones about that. And, and you know, you speak to Indian representatives, political figures, diplomats, they make no bones about the fact that they are going to be the largest country in the world in, 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 in the near future in terms of population, but an economic powerhouse, a tech powerhouse, and, and that's a reality that we all have to, to deal with, and, and India will not apologize for that. China likewise, you know, it's, um, it's compared to 1990, it's, it's, it's just, it's an economic powerhouse and a presence in all our economies, in all our societies. There are challenges there, particularly in the tech area, in the cyberspace area. I don't need to go into any, too much detail there. Uh, so I don't think we can be naive in the European Union. I don't think we can be naive in, in, um, in the US. Uh, but it's, it's not a simple matter of not engaging economically or politically. But there are risks, and I think we need to be alive to those those risks and challenges too. So let's not be naive, uh, you know. To quote President Reagan, you know, trust but verify. Well, I wouldn't even trust. I uh, certainly, I, I, I be, I'd be cautious. And, and, and when it when it comes to strategic space, when it comes to geopolitical space, and when it comes to the economic space, and I also think it's important that, that um, you know, it's important to diversify in terms of your markets and not be reliant on, uh, over reliant on anyone country, any one economy, whether that's the US, whether that's, that's the European Union, whether that's uh, China or India, diversify all the time and hedge your bets and be, be politically aware. I, I think there's a very strong conversation happening between Brussels and Washington in that space um, and that's an important conversation. I'd like to recognize the gentleman with the fashionable neck top. <laughs> Picked it from Ireland. I Thank you imagine. very much to, to you both. Um, my, I'm Jack Meyer. I recently graduated from the Master of Arts in Global Affairs. Uh, my question is uh, I worry whether Putin is a rational actor, and if the situation deteriorates, if he might become desperate. I, I hear experts often saying, oh, well, look. He'll come to his senses, he'll pull the troops out, he'll recognize this, but I wonder if that's, you know, the pressure on Putin, if that's a consideration that a diplomatic solution might be a potential option on the table because of what we're dealing with. Thank you. Yeah, we're back to what, to what Jason spoke earlier about, you know, the, the, the expertise that was there during the Cold War in meeting the Kremlin 
didn't know I was going to write. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the experts uh, uh, predicted the, the fall of Cameroon quite so quickly as it happened in the end. But there was an expertise, and I suppose what we're all trying to do is assess what is happening inside the Kremlin. What's the, 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 the state of mind? Are there voices there that can be listened to? And I, I think no one knows the answer. We can surmise, and we can imagine a leader who's isolated and wants to isolate and doesn't necessarily listen to, to expert advice from officials or other, other political leaders. But I think all, all, I, I have no expertise in that space and, and all I could do is speculate. I think what is really important to do is for, for uh, those who care about Ukraine and support Ukraine to be very clear in the signaling and very clear in the, in the, in the absolute red lines. You know, and I think I spoke about you know Russian troops into any native territory, uh, any use of nuclear weapons, even battlefield nuclear weapons or dirty bombs, any jeopardizing of nuclear power plants. I, I think those red lines are very, very important. That they come from Washington, they come from Europe. I think you know, particularly in relation to nuclear, they're coming from Beijing too. That's very important to avoid missteps. Um, after that, I think it's very, very important that, that Moscow sees and understands the, the absolute support uh, of allies for Ukraine, both politically and, you know, we've spoken of, of, of the military support coming from, from many countries in Europe and from the US, uh, and to know that we're not weak, um, and that if, 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 if Putin and the Kremlin thought, you know, the world was weak in the face of aggression, I think it's 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 very important that he understand we're not weak, and actually this is a line. And I, 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 not just for, for, for NATO or for the European Union or for, for Washington, but for, I spoke with the UN and the broad membership, and when we, we bring resolutions that talk about the charter and, you know, territorial integrity, the right of, of nations to be independent, not be invaded, it gets huge backing, huge backing from across the UN membership, Africa, Asia, Latin America, etc. So this isn't just the West, whatever the West is. It, it's really strong in support of those values and those principles. And, you know, some have surmised maybe maybe the response could have been stronger when, when Georgia was invaded. Could it, maybe perhaps the response could have been stronger when Crimea was invaded. There, there's still tanks in, in Georgia. There still are tanks in Georgia. Um, and, you know, it, it's important. This is, this is a moment when, when you know, weakness is not an option or backtracking. And I, I, I think we, in a, we in, in, when we're on Security Council, we, we were frustrated with, with some calls, some talk of both sides should, or both sides, or, you know, this kind of even handed thing that, that happens. There's no both sides here. You know, the Russian army and the Russian military and the Russian Federation politically has invaded a completely innocent people and are pummeling them into the ground with weapons. I mean, it's disgusting. And we just need to be very clear that that's unacceptable, is now and always will be, and that there's no weakness in our resolve to combat that. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and you're the lucky candidate. Thank you. Uh, my name is Damien William, and I'm an exchange student from France. And uh, considering that there are a lot of members that are part of the UN, and your position as a representative of Ireland at the UN. I was wondering if you felt like you were able to have a, an impact for Ireland or the rest of the world through your position, and if yes, are you satisfied with it, or do you believe you could have been able to do more? Thank you. On the Security Council or as an ordinary member of the, the UN? Both. Okay. It's, it's, it's always a work in progress. The UN is a very, very big, large bureaucracy, 193 member states, the UN Secretary, so many agencies. It can be hard to, to make an impact. Uh, what we try and do, uh, we've always tried to really prioritize a number of key issues for us. One is peacekeeping. We really believe in the role of the UN in, in peacekeeping and peace maintenance. Uh, we've had Irish troops serving with the UN continuously, unbroken since 1958. Very, very important for us. We, we really prioritize human rights uh, and the rights of women and children in particular. But human rights is really, really important for us. We prioritize that and put our efforts there. Uh, likewise, development, 
food security, those kind of issues. I spoke about sustainable development goals, uh, not just humanitarian. I mean, humanitarian solves the immediate crisis, but for us, it's long-term development. You know, really, really working to ensure that, that that all countries, that all peoples, have a have a fair shot at a decent life. You know, uh, not just not just civil rights, but also economic rights, the right to have a you know employment, good employment, healthcare, education for the children, all of these issues. So we, we really prioritise that and we do that in a work day in day out. Uh, on the Security Council, obviously the particular focus on you know peace and security, it, it's that strategic piece, the geopolitical piece. We really sought to to um, make an impact. Uh, but as a continuum of the issues we, we deal with normally, peacekeeping, peace security, peace negotiations, um, human rights, we, we really took a stand on okay, We took a stand in relation to the Taliban in Afghanistan. Just one example, uh, after the fall of Kabul and, and the Taliban took over, um, there was some move to lift, to allow Taliban to travel, uh, you know, uh, sanction waivers, as it were. And we felt, well, no, if women and children can't work and if women and children can't travel, why should Taliban have that luxury? Uh, if they're travelling for peace negotiations, if they're travelling to improve the lot of women, well and good, but if they're travelling to build their, their political base, or if they're travelling to, to uh, do economic contracts, trading contracts, we said no. And we stood firm, and we weren't popular for that decision, but we stood firm, because we felt it's really important the Security Council in the UN say, no, your treatment of women and children is appalling, unacceptable. Um, did it make much difference? They didn't like it. The situation has become increasingly worse for, 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 for the plight of women in Afghanistan. Uh, and we feel it's really important that, that the Security Council maintain a strong voice saying that's unacceptable. And there's always a danger that, that people, that countries want to normalize relations quickly with the de facto or with the reality on the ground. Um, and that's really tricky. It's tricky for UN operations in, in, in Afghanistan. It's tricky for all of us. But it's important to have values and have lines in the sand and say that's not acceptable. Uh, and where it's going and, and the plight of women at the moment. I mean, women are being erased from the public space in Afghanistan week in, week out, and the board stand against that, and we hope we did. Likewise, speaking very strongly in support of Ukraine and against the Russian, Russian, the Russian aggression, it's working with the US on issues like humanitarian aid, very, very important for us. We spoke about the Syrian cross-border corridor. We spoke about, you know, uh, ensuring that, that the peace and operation mandate in, in Bosnia and elsewhere was maintained despite all those geopolitical pressures and those difficult relationships on the Security Council. So doing all we could day in, day out on every issue to ensure um, that we're making a difference to people on the ground. Likewise, we worked very hard to, to bring the, the war in Ethiopia onto the floor of the Security Council. I mean, there's a war that, you know, over 500,000 people died in the space of two years. Most people in, 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 in Ireland, US, Europe, hardly knew about it. It hardly made the headlines. And yet, it had, it had devastating consequences in terms of famine, insecurity, food insecurity, region impact with Sudan, Eritrea. Now we pushed and pushed under, and the UN didn't get involved and broke with a peace agreement in, in, in November 2022. We felt it should have been on the floor of the Council much earlier, and we need to shine a spotlight on what was happening there at a much earlier phase. So it's about making a difference. But I think there's a really important quote in the UN, it was by Dag Hammarskjöld, he was the second Secretary General of the UN, and he said, the UN is not here to create heaven and earth, it's to prevent hell and earth, it's to prevent the worst, it's not going to be perfect, it's going to make mistakes, it's going to fall short, there's going to be sloppy, uneasy compromises, uh, day in day. That's the reality of bringing 193 member states together with, with each of their own interests, uh, but the world would be in a far worse place without the uh, and we saw that in Ireland. I mean, in Ireland, there was famine in 1847, no one cried stop. There was no light shone upon that. This was happening in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Oh, a million people died, a million fled here. Um, so for us, we carry that in our DNA to say, the world must know what's happening in Ethiopia, the world must know what's happening in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, whatever. And even if the UN falls short in terms of what it does, in terms of actions, it's really important. And we need a UN and we need a US that really engages with the UN. It's an indispensable partner. Um, and that political and economic diplomatic engagement. And, um, and I say it was a pleasure for us to work with the US. When President Biden said today in our parliament, when, when the US and Ireland works well together, great things happen. 
And we did that. We did some great things together on the Security Council. And you should be very, very proud of your, your diplomatic representatives. They're very effective, very, very effective in building relationships and partnerships. So suppose in a roundabout world, we, we make an imperfect contribution in an imperfect organization, but we keep on trying to do it day in day, picking up the pieces, whether it's on the Security Council or elsewhere in the UN system. And it's about those those values, remembering conflict in our own land, remembering famine, remembering refugees, remembering all the bad stuff, and just thinking how much better our lives might have been and our story had there been a UN in those days. So we work like Mike and Maine to keep it going and to make it the best it can be for all of us. Thank you. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, I'd like to make a brief um, public service announcement. <laughs> um, uh, FDU is partnering with the UN agency UNITAR uh, this summer to offer a five-week training program to FDU students, both uh, at the undergraduate and the graduate level. Uh, the program is called Preparing for Professional Life in the UN System. Uh, it is a four-credit course for undergraduates. Uh, it's a whatever you want for graduate students. Uh, we had some information uh, at the table in the back. If you didn't pick up a brochure, but you would like one, uh, I'll let you take a photo of mine. Uh, and I'm also happy to answer any questions that you have about the program. Uh, I hope that you will uh, stay and join us for some informal conversation with the ambassador, uh, some refreshment. Um, uh, but uh, for now, please join me in thanking you. Can I just say one final word? Absolutely. <laughs> I love a mic. You can't, you can't get an Irishman away from a mic. Um, I'm very conscious that many of you are doing global relations, international relations. What are they doing business or doing other issues? We had a group of Irish business people in with us last week visiting the UN. I asked them, why are you visiting the UN? You're on a trade mission, different world, different spheres. And the answer was, no, it's what you do here is very similar to how we can succeed in business. It's building good relationships, building trust, engaging, uh, reaching out, negotiating and compromising and so what he was trying to do with all the people the business people he brought from Ireland was to say actually this is relevant and actually the work that Ireland does here and the work that other members is doing in the UN is about a world where people can, can, can trade and do business and create business opportunities so the idea that we're in silos business over there international relations over there it's not the case at all and the skills that make good diplomats and that, that build achievements like Good Friday Agreement or all those other issues I spoke about are the same skills that work I think in all spheres of life, good relationships uh, and that's why thank God we're out of COVID and we're meeting in rooms like this together and um, that's where the magic happens uh, and you know whatever you go and whatever you do in life um, I wish you the very very best. It's just great to get an opportunity to speak with you and I'll be here for a little while yet and very happy to, to chat informally in those great spaces over there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.